Welcome back to Source. My name is Darsh, and today we'll be revisiting some of history's not so friendly faces, aka the 10 people you probably shouldn't follow back on Instagram. Starting out with number 10, meet Adolf Hitler, the guy whose mustache was so unique it could have had its own Instagram account. Born in 1889, Hitler had dreams of being an artist, but when the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts sent his application to the reject pile, he decided that a career in politics may be a better fit. Q World War I, a failed coup and a failed acting career later, Hitler wrote The Main Comp, a literary piece that we would now wish was just a paint-by-numbers kit. Fast forward to 1933 when he became the Chancellor of Germany, he began to unleash anti-Semitic policies. This was what we know as the beginning of the Holocaust, one of the largest mass genocides in contemporary history, with over 53 million civilians and military casualties. Fast forward to 1945, as the Allied forces began to close in, Hitler chose a dramatic exit in his Berlin bunker and, let's just say, dropped the mic. His death marked the close of a dark chapter, but the consequences of his actions continue to shape history today. Moving on to number 9, let's dive into Joseph Stalin, the guy who took the term Soviet makeover a little too seriously. Born in Georgia in 1878, Stalin climbed the Communist Party ladder, introducing industrialization, collectivization, and the Great Purge to the Soviet Union. Imagine him as the ultimate makeover guru, turning rural farms into the less-than-stylish labor camp chic. Yikes. After World War II, Stalin played puppet master in Eastern Europe during the Cold War. He might not have had a super cool mustache or anything, but he sure knew how to style a political hairdo. Stalin's exit in 1953 marked the end of an era, with other leaders scrambling to fix the policies that were almost as questionable as his haircut. Moving on to number 8, let's chat about Paul Pope, the brains behind the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Born in 1925, Paul Pope's regime was like a really bad makeover show. In 1975, the Khmer Rouge took over Phnom Penh, transforming Cambodia into something called the Democratic Kampuchea. Not exactly the tropical paradise that you'd be expecting. Paul Poe's big idea for society was one without classes, including forcing people into labor camps, committing mass atrocities, and basically aiming for a look that we'll just dub revolutionary chic for simplicity. Spoiler alert, Vietnam was not a fan at all, so they decided to crash the party in 1978, leading to Paul Poe's jungle adventure until he called it quits in 1998. Next up, at number 7, meet Mao Zedong, the trailblazer of China's wild ride throughout history. Born in 1893, Mao's journey through this Chinese civil war was like a fashion parade for everyone to watch. From the May 4th movement to creating the Chinese Communist Party, Mao's resume included the Jiangxi Soviet and the Long March. Think of it as his, let's just say, catwalk to power. After World War II, Mao's big ideas like the Great Leap Forward turned into a fashion faux pas, so to speak, causing a famine that left millions feeling more hangry than stylish. The Cultural Revolution in 1966 was like Mao's attempt at a wardrobe change, just a change, but it mostly ended up in a widespread persecution. Mao's exit in 1976 marked the end of an era, leaving China with mixed feelings about his legacy. It's like a fashion review with some thumbs up and a few raised eyebrows. Next up, let's dive into Idi Amin's story, the heavyweight player in Uganda whose leadership style was scarier than a dystopian blockbuster movie. Born in 1925, Amin's journey from the British colonial army to Fresden was more like an underdog story gone seriously awry than anything else. Imagine Rocky Balboa turning into a horror movie villain. That's more so the vibe here. His regime? Picture a crash course in ruthless rule, with arbitrary killings and a cult of personality that even the Kardashians would find excessive. It was like having a dictator who believed he was both the director and the star of a terrifying show that everyone was forced to watch. Now here's the plot twist. Amin's aggressive moves triggered the Uganda-Tanzania War in 1978-1979. to Tanzanian forces basically handed him an eviction notice, and Amin had to pack his bags, or whatever a dictator would pack, and just skedaddle. He didn't get too far though, settling in Saudi Arabia to live out the rest of his days. Next up, let's shine a light on Leopold II the Belgian royal whose Congo Free State venture unfolded like an ultimate colonialism gone wild episode. Imagine it's the mid-1800s and Leopold becomes king of the Belgians in 1865, a prestigious role that comes with, you know, just a, a smidge of power. Fast forward to 1885, where things start to take a really dark turn. Leopold scores the Congo Free State at Berlin Conference, essentially adding it to his royal real estate portfolio. But this real estate move didn't end well. Instead, it turned into a horror show, with Leopold's rule resembling a DIY project gone horribly wrong. You know, the one that you tried to do, you thought you could do, what you really couldn't do? 
That's really what happened here. Now, what did this project involve? Forced labor, brutal treatment, and enough international outcry to make headlines worldwide. The situation got so out of hand that Belgium, the country that Leopold was supposed to be representing, had to step in and take over in 1908. It was like they had to intervene and clean up the mess left by their own monarch. This intervention, however, left Leopold II with a pretty damning title as the worst king ever. Imagine having that tag associated with your royal legacy. Jumping in with number 4, Saddam Hussein. Let's dive into his story, the Iraqi leader who conducted a chaotic symphony in the country. Picture it, born in 1937, he started making headlines with his role in the devastating Iran-Iraq war, and then cranked up the intensity by invading Kuwait, because who doesn't love a surprise invasion every now and again? Now, post the Gulf War, things started to take a darker turn. Saddam Hussein didn't stop at military actions. He unleashed a wave of brutal suppressions and got the world raising eyebrows with accusations of having weapons of mass destruction. It was like he wanted to win the award of the worst neighbor of the decade. Now, as the plot thickened, Hussein found himself in a courtroom facing trial. The verdict? Guilty. The final act? A hanging in 2006. Next up, at number 3, let's unravel the story of Kim Il Sung the maestro of North Korean politics who played the game with the strategic finesse of a chess champion. Born in 1912, Kim made his mark by initiating the Korean War in 1950, executing moves that strategically divided the peninsula like a grandmaster planning crucial maneuvers on a geopolitical chessboard. As the chessboard began to take shape, Kim didn't just stop there. He crafted the Jush ideology, essentially setting up a dynastic regime that turned North Korea into a real-life game of political chess. Imagine a game featuring pieces like purges, forced labor, and executions. Basically Monopoly, but just with a lot more dark alleyways. Now, for the big reveal, Kim Il-sung's legacy of brutality didn't fade away with his death in 1994. Instead, it set the stage for a sequel featuring his son, Kim Jong-il. It's like the game of political chess continued, passing from one generation to the next, with each move leaving a lasting impact on North Korea's complex political landscape. At number 2, let's delve into the story of Hideki Tojo, the puppet master of Japan's militaristic era whose actions cast a dark shadow over East Asia. Born in Tokyo in 1884, Tojo's climb to chief of staff in 1940 was just the opening act for Japan's aggressive expansion, with a cast featuring war crimes and territorial takeovers. Not exactly a Broadway hit. Imagine Tojo as the conductor of a not-so-harmonious symphony. As Prime Minister, he took center stage, orchestrating Japan's entry into World War II with a notorious attack on Pearl Harbor. It's as if he waved his baton and the drums of war started beating across the Pacific. Now, let's shift to the post-war seat. Japan surrenders in 1945, and Tojo finds himself in the spotlight at the Tokyo Trials. The verdict? Guilty. The final act? A hanging in 1948. Tojo's legacy is like a war drumbeat that still echoes in the pages of history, a solemn reminder of a turbulent era that shaped the course of East Asian history. Last but not least, at number 1, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, the political showman with a legacy as confusing as a magic trick gone wrong. Born in 1942, Gaddafi quietly started his rise to power in 1969, becoming the leader of the Libyan Arab Republic. Now imagine this, Gaddafi wasn't your typical leader because he got there through different means than others, with a bloodless coup making political moves that left everyone scratching their heads. It's almost as though he pulled off a magic trick and then suddenly, he's the top guy. But the show didn't stop there. Gaddafi, armed with his ideas from the Green Book, took on socialist principles, anti-imperialist stances, and supported revolutionary movements worldwide. It's like he had a bag full of political tricks up his sleeve. Now, let's fast forward to the main event in 2011 during the Arab Spring. Protests in Libya led to a civil war and NATO got involved. This wasn't part of Gaddafi's magic show, it was more like a plot twist that no one knew was going to happen. The intervention ended up with Gaddafi being overthrown, captured, and eventually passing away in October 2011. So what's the punchline to Gaddafi's grand finale? A legacy that's a mix of political ideologies, controversies, and a tumultuous downfall. It's like he left the audience with a cliffhanger and we're still trying to figure out the overall plot of what just happened. And that ties up some of the worst people throughout history. If you like this video guys, make sure to subscribe to the channel for more and comment below what you want to hear about next. With that being said, we'll see you in the next video.